Thanks so much for having um, accepted this invitation to open our um, workshop. Um, uh, those of you uh, who happened, uh, I don't think there are any here, uh, to um, uh, participate at uh, a further meeting, we had a very short one, uh, uh, know already that uh, uh, Natalie Henisha uh, is the author of a big book, uh, um, the, this one, De Valeur, um, for um, Gallimard. Um, but she's now uh, making available her current research on this subject, uh, a uh, pragmatic approach to values, a pragmatic redefinition of values toward a general model of valuation is uh, um, the, the title of this forthcoming work it in progress. It was uh, two, two days ago, the, the paper. It has been oh, published I see. Two, so two days ago in Theory, Culture and Society. So. Very well. Mm. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, as sociologist, just two words to present here uh, to, to people who maybe might not be completely familiar with the sociological approach to values. In fact, uh, it's a very ambitious project, uh, aiming at establishing a, a real uh, common language, kind of uh, conceptual frame for empirical research into an indefinite number of uh, uh, social issues where values and valuation are at stake. Uh, you know, we, we can take any of the many examples she gave in her book, uh, uh, such as, for example, uh, uh, art criticism, movie criticism, theater criticism, but also opinion polls or public petitions uh, or uh, a nightmare for us all uh, academic evaluation or uh, to, to go into matter more for me, we are more familiar with cultural conflicts uh, or political discord or uh, axiological justification of our legal system, moral system, and so on and so on. So what is my job here? We decide, I mean, that was very, uh, in a way, nice uh, uh, of uh, Natalie. Um, she preferred to have a kind of exchange in the sense I'm the mediator he's uh, toward philosophy, so to speak, uh, allowing Natalie to expound her key concepts, uh, uh, maybe, working as, at the same time, helping the philosophers here uh, to catch hold of some traditional uh, uh, philosophical claims uh, 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 that might indeed go unnoticed. Uh, because in fact, uh, one of the points uh, in Natalie's approach uh, is that she um, insists on keeping uh, her approach distinct uh, from any philosophical dispute uh, uh, about the nature of values. Now, I'm not sure that this is what actually happens uh, in in fact uh, and uh, well uh, anyway it's nice that we have here a, a, a kind of a possible uh, you know a comparison of two different approaches one which is in a way of course uh, more uh, uh, metaphysical and one which is uh, uh, quite sociological as, as this one. I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, a mediator and uh, to, to, to a, a translator so to speak so um, I, First of all, I, I would uh, maybe ask uh, uh, Natalie to present uh, generally this uh, uh, this project, and then uh, we we go on to uh, to the okay. questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so about the pragmatic uh, meaning of value, and in this paper, I try to draw the main theoretic lines sustaining the new pragmatic approaches of the issue of value, and it's a definition which is most likely to become a redefinition. Under what conditions can sociology address the notion of value while remaining a social science rather than a scholarly support for morals or a normative guide for action and evaluation? as are moral philosophy and moral sociology? And under what conditions is it possible to construct a unified concept of value that would work for all the concerned disciplines, not only sociology, but also economics, psychology, anthropology, philosophy? And to answer these two questions, 
I have replaced a series of familiar but unsatisfactory oppositions by redefinitions which I think are more appropriate to a pragmatic approach of this object. And so I will just briefly list these conceptual shifts. They are nine, and I'll do it uh, slowly so that you can note and maybe choose what kinds of um, shifts you would like me to develop after my um, conversation with Roberta. If we have time, I can develop one or another uh, of these uh, conceptual shifts. So, uh, in a very stenographic form, uh, the first shift is a shift from the notion of value to that of valuation. The second shift is a shift from the opposition between value as intrinsic or extrinsic the object to a concept of value as a combination of mental frames, objective affordances, and social institutions. The third shift is a shift from two symmetrical misconceptions of value as an essence or as an illusion to its conception as a shared mental representation. The fourth shift is a shift from the opposition between values and norms to an articulated set of mental representations and frames for action. The fifth shift is a shift from the conception of value as a matter of price to an extended conception of value as a matter of measure, of attachment, and of judgment. The sixth shift is a shift from the opposition between values and interests to a distinction between public and private values. The seventh shift is a shift from a conception of value focused on things to an extended conception also focused on persons, actions, and states of the world. The eighth shift is a shift from the opposition between value and values, with an S, to an integrative model able to articulate the three meanings of the word value into a one and same research project. And the ninth and last shift is a shift from the misleading opposition between interactionism and structuralism to a distinction between three articulated moments of valuation. And such a redefinition of some basic issues in the sociology of values should open the way to a pluridisciplinary frame for an empirical and pragmatic study of the actual processes of valuation. So here is a kind of summary of my book. And now uh, maybe we can have a kind of dialogue with Roberta. And if you want later each of you to uh, have me develop one or another um, item, well, just tell me. Very well, very well, thank you. So as you probably understood uh, um, already from this uh, very uh, uh, sh short uh, presentation, um, the so, so to speak pragmatical uh, or pragmatic term in uh, uh, Nagari's uh, uh, way of approaching values uh, is uh, um, uh, the fact that she uh, uh, she focused not so much on a so largely undefined and dubious entity like values, uh, as, uh, as some uh, uh, things they, they are dubious and undefined. We will see maybe uh, during the discussion that uh, if, uh, whether this, this is the only possible view. Anyway, the, the switch from, from 
from a focus on values uh, to a focus on valuations in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, whatever expressive behavior, speech acts, uh, uh, social acts, uh, activities uh, in which something like a valuation uh, uh, expresses uh, become become observable so to speak uh, uh, this is a a move uh, uh, which is very similar in fact uh, to the one we find in uh, John Dewey's pragmatic of, uh, um, of values and valuations in fact so starting from from these uh, very uh, large uh, overarching kind of uh, methodological move. I would uh, ask a first question, um, exactly on this point, how uh, must this pragmatic redefinition of values be uh, understood? I mean, does it not entail, uh, entail already a decision which has a very philosophical character? And in fact, uh, uh, a decision which uh, uh, is uh, one of the main uh, uh, issues in contemporary metaethics, uh, um, uh, namely uh, concerning uh, the, the, the status of values themselves uh, and the, 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 the claim, more or less implicit, that they are not given, but in a way created or posited by this evaluation. Is that the case or maybe not? So but my answer would be that uh, values are both given and created, I see no reason to exclude one of the terms, but the condition that you consider, but that uh, if they are given, it's not by a metaphysical entity, but by the collective set of value resources. Uh, an individual has at his disposition a set of value resources, exactly as a grammar, uh, on the ling linguistic level that he uses. And in this uh, perspective, this is given to him, to the mm -hmm. individual. But at the same time, values are created, but not by an actor alone. This would be, you know, the uh, individualist uh, illusion, what uh, Norbert Elias uh, called obocloses, the illusion that people would be defined independently from the others. So uh, values are created not by an individual actor, but by interactions between actors within context. And this is a very important uh, thing. I have to say that the creation of values is made out of three components. The people, the individuals who evaluate, the evaluated objects and what's very important, the context of valuation. And so there, are, there is a kind of creation of values through these interactions when valuations are produced, but of course uh, they, they are not individual creations. And this is very important because this perspective allows us to integrate two very different traditions in the social sciences and also I think in philosophy, the one being the structuralist tradition, which um, means that there are uh, underground underlying structures which determine the individual's activities, representations, feelings, and so on. And the, the very opposite, apparently opposite tradition, which is the tradition of interactionism, both are totally opposite in the sociological tradition, uh, which, is, which focuses on, of course, interactions between individuals and which um, takes as um, evident that uh, everything is constructed through interactions. So these traditions are totally um, contradictory, but I think that they are just two moments of valuation because there is one moment when valuation is produced out of this set of accessible resources that we all possess, and this is the structuralist perspective. It's already there and it 
partly determines our valuations. And the, the other moment is the moment in, in which valuation occurs in a certain context between people, we, um, supported by institutions. And then there is, of course, an interactionist perspective at stake in the valuation processes. So instead of opposing the notion of given or created structuralist or interactionist, we have to consider then that these are but two moments of the valuation processes. Is it okay? <laughs> Okay, and uh, Nathalie, uh, uh, you'll notice that this uh, this move uh, is typical of this thought. Huh? Instead of having an either or, you have in a way both of them, and and, and this is uh, the very point of constructing, if I have understood, of constructing a, a an axiological grammar in a way, uh, okay. where in fact uh, you 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 try to describe. All the different, so to speak, parameters of a uh, whole uh, global, uh, in a in a way, uh, account uh, of a uh, uh, valuation situation. Uh, anyway, I, I go on to the to the uh, second question now, uh, which is insists anyway on one sense of givenness. Uh, uh, which might be particularly challenging, uh, uh, at least uh, from a philosophical point of view. Um, in, as, as everybody uh, knows, uh, um, there is a, a, a set of uh, properties of things uh, uh, that became very popular in the last century or so, uh, the affordances. Um, and the, the affordances of things seem to be a class of value qualities, actually, uh, that would favor the idea uh, that values are in a way given, but not given uh, in the sense of inherited uh, in a uh, tradition, in a system of uh, cultural habits and so on, but given to the experience, to individual experience on one hand. And on the other hand, uh, they would, uh, so they would uh, 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 suggest uh, that values can be really intrinsic uh, uh, is rather than extremes in, uh, to the valued thing. So that this valuation in that case would respond much more than pose it uh, uh, a value in, in the thing. So the, the general question is, uh, 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 how does your uh, project position itself relative to the issue extrinsic, intrinsic, also with the view of this problem, for example? This is also a very interesting uh, issue. Um, I have to say that first that affordances, as uh, James Gibson defined them in his uh, book on uh, ecological perception, I have to precise that in French we use the translation prise in order to translate affordance, which I think is a very good idea. It, it has been proposed by um, Francis Chateaurino, and I think he's right in it. So affordances are not values because values are representations. They are axiological representations. Affordances are but material properties of objects. Uh, this is very important. And so affordances, uh, they do not change anything to the representational status of values, you know. Um, valuation is a combination of, of strict extrinsic sources, that is, the represented representations that the actors have of what is valuable, and of intrinsic resources, which means affordances, we intrinsic to the valuated objects. And it is this combination of representations and properties, material properties, objective properties of the objects, which uh, allows us to make valuations. So once more, we don't have to oppose extrinsic and intrinsic, but we have to think that they are two combinated entities which allow us to construct our valuations. Is it clear enough or should I develop? Definitely very clear. I mean, you assert uh, that uh, values uh, are uh, mental representations. Now, uh, as you probably know, the, the, there is a whole uh, trend of uh, 
researchers are asserting that uh, values are rather, if anything, uh, a mental presentation of things, namely that the valuation is a, a direct kind of relation, an, an experiential kind of relation, which would, uh, in a way, make the connection with affordances as, uh, uh, you know, what, what you can do with things uh, because you receive from them directly an invi- a kind of invi- invitation to do something with them without having a, a kind of a concept uh, mediating it and so on and so on. But uh, uh, my question wasn't uh, just insisting on this point. One can go further in a sociological perspective and saying that uh, um, in a way, uh, yes, value are mental representation, but uh, uh, in the sense of a very collective ones, uh, actually social constraints. Uh, this is a very popular kind of position in uh, uh, at least uh, current sociology or sociological philosophy. Uh, in that case, even uh, the very idea that uh, um, I uh, I make a commitment, a value commitment, as an autonomous, uh, uh, you know, commitment in, in a way, something I decide to do, uh, would be just uh, illusory. Uh? Um, so mental representation in a very feeble sense, in a very weak sense of, uh, you know, something you, you pick up from the society you are in and you are just... Uh, 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 alluded to uh, think uh, that you have uh, you, you encounter values and you have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, positions of uh, uh, preferences uh, between values and you you do a value commitment preference preference commitment so on and so on. So what, what what is your position about about this point? So do you share this claim? This cons- social constructivist claim, uh, which makes uh, the whole issue with values from the personal point of view, pretty illusory. So um, I would answer that everything in social life is socially constructed. So (laughs) saying (laughs) that something is a social construction is but totally definition because it's, it's, you know, it's it's obvious. Mm. Uh, I don't see what in social life wouldn't be socially constructed. Uh, So it's, it's not the right question to be raised. The question is uh, if we, uh, speak of uh, autonomy, autonomous value commitments, as you said. Um, autonomy regarding what? If autonomy means individual autonomy versus social determination, this I think is rather naive because there is neither absolute individual autonomy nor absolute social determination. Experience is a mixture of personal data and collective constraints and resources. So there cannot be any absolute autonomy nor absolute heteronomy. Once more, (laughs) you have very well grasped my way of thinking. We don't have to oppose these two concepts, autonomy and heteronomy, but to observe the way Uh, our relationship to the world, and particularly our relationship to valuations, um, is produced along a continuous line between the pull of the maximum of autonomy regarding social data constraints and so on, and the pull of maximum heteronomy. Uh, uh, that, That is all. And so we don't have to decide whether uh, values are autonomous or not autonomous. Uh, they are just a possibility on a line between uh, this um, pull of autonomy from social constructs and um, and and heteronomy that is uh, um, a, a, a very strong um, uh, relationship with uh, social constructs. Is it okay? This scholarly habit to um, use concepts as discontinuous positions for which you have to choose. You have to be in one camp or in the other camp, in the camp of determination or in the camp of autonomy, etc., etc. It's a totally artificial way uh, to put things. Uh, It's a very agonistic way which allows people to feel 
that they belong to such a family. I belong to the structuralist family or to the interactionist family, but uh, it has something to do with war, but not with uh, thinking. When you want to think the real way, the actual way in which people live their experience, you have to consider that there are various ways and according to the circumstances, such or such a position is more or less uh, actual. If I may, I do have a question. I have a question about uh, your notion of um, evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now there is uh, this, I mean, uh, I, the question has to do with, uh, you know, philosophy of mind, basically. And I was wondering what sort of state of mental state an evaluation is. And the reason why I'm asking that is um, because uh, uh, if one, as I think, I mean, presumably you would agree with that, but uh, I, I'd like to hear more ab about your view on this. Um, if evaluation is at some sort of doxastic state, then it must have some conditions of satisfaction. There must be something in the world that make that evaluation correct or incorrect, adequate or, ad or not adequate, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But now I wonder if you, uh, if you argue that um, um, values are a matter of evaluation, then what is it that makes that evaluation, one evaluation, correct or incorrect, adequate or inadequate? Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Does the question yes, make sense? It's a very good question. And it allows me to come back to my favorite comparison with grammar. It's exactly the same with the linguistic grammar. What makes a sentence correct or incorrect? It is its uh, adequacy with the grammar that we use in our language. And uh, grammar, which is a collective uh, set of resources. Uh, and it's exactly the same with the uh, axiological grammar, the grammar of values. We all know, we all master implicitly, even if we don't know the theory, but we master this capacity to formulate valuations which can be conceived and perceived by the other people as correct, if, even if they don't agree with. They can say, no, I don't think this film is great, it's not so good, etc. Et but they accept that our valuation is correctly um, produced exactly as language. So um, they, what makes our valuations acceptable is their uh, adequacy with this axiological grammar that we all share, even if we don't know it. Right, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the analogy um, is, as people say, is, um, as good as it goes in the sense that um, if I look at a sentence, uh, now you are perfectly right that um, a sentence must uh, first of all, uh, be well formed and well formed in the sense of the grammar, right? It must follow the grammatical rules of a certain natural language. Mm -hmm. But that per se doesn't make the sentence true or false. Exactly. exactly. Right? So, what makes the sentence true or false is something in the world that either exists or does not exist. Exactly. Uh -huh. And if we transpose this distinction uh, uh, now to the discussion about evaluations and values, then one could certainly say is that evaluations must follow a certain grammatical structure in order to be well formed, but still that doesn't give that doesn't answer the question of whether that evaluation is true or false. There must be something else that makes that evaluation true or so false. So evaluations can be true or false. They don't obey to truth um, uh, proofs, épreuves de vérité. Uh, truth is not the matter with values. The matter with values is the relative adequacy between um, the way we evaluate an object and uh, both the objective properties of the object and the context of valuation. And this makes our valuations more or less shareable, more or less uh, acceptable by the other people. Uh, and of course, once evaluation is widely shared, it um, offers the object a certain value, uh, a, a relatively accepted value. So uh, did you get, did no, I? No, I see. Yeah. But then if I may follow up, uh, so 
let me push you uh, on this point. It's uh, um, um, so it's, it's an example that I usually discuss in my class in moral psychology. <laughs> so I would like to hear your view on that. So suppose that uh, for some reason uh, we are back in time. We are in 1944. The Holocaust is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Nazis are putting millions of Jews into the, the gas chambers. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, you have uh, the Nazi perpetrator that uh, looks at uh, the destruction of millions uh, of people. And uh, the Nazi perpetrator says something like, yes, this is good. It is good to destroy uh, and to annihilate the Jews. And, and then you have somebody else uh, who says, um, it's not a German, maybe somebody else would, would, would deny that and says, no, it's wrong uh, to put all those people in the gas chamber. Mm -hmm. Now, if I understand you correctly, uh, we are forced based on, a, on your view to say that um, if uh, the Nazi had won the war, right? And everybody endorsed the Nazi ideology, then we've, we would be committed to say that that evaluation that the Nazi perpetrator made, that evaluation is correct because it is the, 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 the one that is more widely accepted. Yes, I understand your, 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 your question, which is typically, and it's very interesting, um, the, the issue of relativism or absolutism of values. So uh, my answer is that we have to take this question on two different levels. The first level is the level of the researcher who observes the way people evaluate. And then his, the researcher is forced to, um, to make the conclusion, to conclude that there is a relativity of valuation since for, for the natives, what we do is good. Uh, maybe you know the excellent books by uh, Johan Chaputo who uh, studied the values of the natives. So he shows how their acts correspond to strong values for them. So um, if, you, if you just observe, you, you have to conclude that there is this relativity since for natives, it, what they do is good, and of course, for antinatists, it is totally awful. But this is the level of the observation that the researcher does when, that is a sociologist, when trying to study uh, the actions representations, which is the level on which I work. There is another level which is the normative and not any more descriptive or analytical, the normative level of uh, um, the answer to the question, what is good or bad, which is a question for the actors, not for the researchers. So if you stand on the level of the actors, then, uh, of course, there are absolute values and there are values which have to be defended because they are the right values and values which have to be opposed because they are the wrong values. So on the normative level, of course, there is an answer to the question you raise, that is, um, Nate's values, cannot be considered as real values. They are anti-values, they are wrong values. This is the normative answer of the actors that you can discuss, of course, but there, there is a, 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 an answer. But on the level of the researcher and the sociologist, uh, right. relativity is, is the norm because there is effectively, actually, a relativity of the relationship of actors to values. Okay, so the, yes, I, I can I, yeah. I can phrase it another way. Um, in order to uh, in order to um, have values, evaluate, share valuations, and so on, so on, you have to consider that your values are absolute, that they are the right values, and that you are right to defend them. But at the same time. If you observe the way valuations work, values are relative. And this is a very important statement which has been proposed by Gérard Genette in L'Oeuvre de l'Art, regarding, of, co of course, the value of artworks. Uh, values are both relative on the level of 
the description of valuations and uproot the level of the normativity of values. Is it uh, clear? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sir Alessandro. I'm happy that you in, you, you had a, a way uh, to, to intervene and, and keep uh, the, the debate alive. Uh, I, I think that what, what Natalie just said, uh, in a way, um, is useful uh, to understand, in a way, uh, the point of view, the completely uh, empirical, so to speak, point of view of the kind of uh, um, research uh, she, uh, she claims to be, and in a way, um, uh, the empirical aim of the um, uh, meta language uh, she's trying to um, to build uh, uh, to allow sociological uh, research and values in that sense that in fact what uh, um, Natalie said namely uh, the meta linguistic level of uh, the research relative to the uh, direct or first order level of valuations and and, and position takings and and commit commitment and so on is right but it's only right in her sense uh, if we add uh, that uh, the uh, um, uh, the, the meta language uh, uh, she's using is just for empirical purposes uh, just descriptive of what uh, de facto happens uh, i mean it's it's uh, it's in a way uh, the, the the meaning of the uh high height of the value neutrality according to weber um it's not necessarily necessarily the fact uh, that in, uh, the sociologist wouldn't uh, take a position in case uh, he were uh, at, at, the, at the first level, but at the second order he doesn't, just because any um, uh, valuation, uh, commitment and so on is taken like as, I mean, as a social fact. So it's just a descriptive position. Am I right? Am I interpreting you right? Yes. So in a way, in a way, if I may conclude, this is not at all completely satisfactory for the philosopher because, in fact, the meta-linguistic level of the sociologist is not the only one. Of course, meta-ethicists have the same position, uh, posing themselves at the second order, and yet they do uh, they do dispute uh, uh, on the very nature, in fact, uh, relative or not. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, the, the, the question whether any value judgment has, we, yes or no, uh, uh, truth conditions, and that's the point, right? No, no, you're, you're absolutely right, because this issue of neutrality is fundamental. For me, the work of a researcher, at least a sociologist, has to remain neutral. He doesn't work in order to help people take six positions and so on, but he works in order to understand the way people take stakes, which is quite different. I understand it is quite deceptive, uh, ex especially for philosophers and philosophers of values, because uh, <laughs> philosophers uh, often, well, not all, because um, analytical philosophers, it's different, but um, most philosophers um, are interested in, in values because they want to uh, propose answers to normative questions. And this for me, has not to be the uh, aim of the sociologist. The sociologist is a researcher, he's a scientist who is just trying to analyze, describe and modelize the actor's experience. So if you, um, if you are uh, waiting for an answer to moral questions, Forget and don't read books, you know, <laughs> there is no answer. I just try to, once more, to frame the resources the actors have in order to answer moral questions, which is quite different. Is Alessandro okay with this answer? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I think this is um, exactly the point. So I guess uh, when uh, philosophers ask the question about values, what uh, they are mainly interested in is, Right. How do value or how do uh, how are our moral judgments related to values? What is mm -hmm. there the relation? And uh, I think uh, uh, yes, we want to see whether there are truth makers of um, uh, moral judgments. Whether there is something in the world that makes this judgment true or false, and what are those things? So exactly. I guess and it's a different perspective. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe just to 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 complete. Uh, I mean. Uh, um, 
uh, if I may, um, uh, Natalie answer, uh, uh, well, it's not uh, exact uh, uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, philosophers uh, do that because they look for normative uh, solutions to uh, value problems, not in the least. I mean, the meta-ethical philosophers uh, are not, uh, um, you know, they, they can completely um, um, disregard uh, the level of normative ethics. Uh, they just start, you know, uh, disputing about a theoretical question, uh, the nature of values. It is what I was going to, to, to say, that all philosophers do not have this kind of normative uh, relationship to the issue of values. And if you take Dewey, his notion of valuation is a wonderful, wonderfully descriptive and analytical notion. It's an empirical tool and not a, a answer to a kind of more question. And this is why I say I really want to construct a sociology of values which is not only far from philosophical, um, for, 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 from moral philosophy, but also for, from moral sociology. I don't want to do any kind of moral sociology because it would mean trying to provide uh, moral answers to moral questions, which is not at all my aim.